obviously, you know, you feel, I mean, distressed when you see, when you see people realizing what they're going to lose as a result of the Taliban coming back into power. The Taliban is gonna find its victory very challenging. Afghanistan was an economy supported largely by foreign aid. There'll be plenty of time to criticize and second guess when this operation is over. But now, now, I'm focused on getting this job done. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Monday, the 23rd of August. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Dip buying ahead of Jackson Hole sees stocks climb and futures climb. Bitcoin breaks above $50,000 for the first time since May. Angela Merkel's CDU slumps to an all-time low in the polls a month away from Germany's elections, while she pushes for sanctions against Russia if Nord Stream 2 is used as a weapon. And President Biden expands the U.S. evacuation efforts in Afghanistan beyond Kabul airport amid criticism of his decision to push ahead with withdrawal. G7 leaders meet virtually tomorrow. So stocks and futures on the rise this morning as traders take advantage of last week's sell-off. Treasury yields also ticking higher as demand for havens wanes and Bitcoin hit $50,000 for the first time since May. Markets largely in a holding pattern as investors look ahead to Jackson Hole Symposium on Thursday. Well, joining us to talk about everything in the markets is our Eddie van der Velt from our M Live team with the CFA. Eddie, we have a lot to talk about because it kind of feels that the market is positioned, you know, I guess four or five months ago. Most analysts we spoke to were expecting the S&P 500 to go higher. Right. But actually now there's a real dichotomy about, you know, what they're expecting it to do. And I wonder whether Jackson Hole will kind of distill mines. I think Jackson Hole will absolutely distill mines. I think there's a lot of pressure on Jackson Hole. And I think there is a little bit of scope for, you know, a little bit of disappointment, a little bit of too much expectation going into Jackson Hole. But I do think that this is just the culmination of, you know, getting traders to, to, to focus on this dichotomy between, between, on the one hand, inflation and on the other, you know, growth returning and do we keep growth going and the delta variance out there and all of these things and just making traders pick a side. And I think that's where we're going right now. So d does it mean we'll probably see a lot more choppy markets like we saw, for example, in commodities? I think that is exactly right. I think that I think w w which way we're going to go is unclear at this moment in time, but I think there's going to be a little bit of a, a pull and tug in both directions where markets try and decide, you know, who's who's in the majority here. Um, liquidity is still very thin, and I think that adds to, you know, just the fact, the fact that we're in summer markets and it is low liquidity and it is, is low volumes, I think that adds to the bit of choppiness that you're pointing at. There. So what are you looking at? There's quite a lot in markets at the moment. I mean, today's PMIs, I thought, was particularly interesting. I think what we are seeing from the PMIs, from the German number and from the French number, is that we're seeing that continued shift away from the goods, you know, goods demand only towards services demand as well. And I think that pushes up wages, okay. right, in, the, in Western markets, which potentially fuels the expectation that the Fed tapers as soon as this year. I mean, I'm so glad I have my crypto guru also, you know, to get me started on Monday because Bitcoin above 50,000 at yeah. the weekend and then a lot of momentum also maybe coming from PayPal saying that they will offer crypto to UK users. Way, way faster. This bounce back has come way, way faster than people had expected. You know, I mean, in previous sell-offs, 2017, we saw crypto sell off and it fell by about 80 percent and then had a multi-year period. And the only thing that got it back up to the highs was when the uh, supply of Bitcoin started tapering off. That's not the the case this time. There's a lot of other things to be bullish about. As you say, PayPal in the UK. Now, it's not as big news as the previous PayPal, uh, you know, announcement in the US, because here in the UK, there are other companies, Revolut and other companies that yeah. already do this. But uh, at the same time, it just shows that access points to Bitcoin are increasing. Um, and if we see that US ETF, I think that could be really interesting. Is there anything else, Eddie, that you're looking at? I know we were chatting about an ETF or, you know, the, the guy from the big short. Oh, Actually, that's such a good story. It is such a good story. I mean, look, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a classic contrarian, but I think I think that distills back to all of the all of the themes that we were talking about a minute ago, right? He's talking about um, your long-term treasury re rates starting to rise. And really, we're talking about a trend that's been, it's, it's been a lower trend since the 1970s. Treasury rates have been, and if he's right, 
if he's right as he was last time. You know, um, this is uh, for, for people like Ray Dalio and the risk parity people, for, you know, for, for long-term equities, there are so many points where, where this will actually have negative implications. This could be a bigger short than the big short. Yeah, so we would be looking at like a repricing of almost all asset Absolutely classes, right? Absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. Because, you know, at the moment, when you look at, when you look at US equities, the, the valuations that they have are all about the discount rate. The risk discount rate's been so low that, you know, any earnings, any future earnings are discounted at this very low rate. Um, but if we start seeing long-term treasuries pick up, and the, the mechanism would be that inflation starts picking up. So we're back to Jackson Hole, we're back to the Fed. But if we do see that, you know, I think markets across the board could reprice here. Eddie, thank you so much. Eddie van der Waal there from our M Live team. Now, let's keep the market conversation going. We're joined by Ed Smith, co-chief investment officer at Rathbones. Ed, great to have you on a Monday morning. What are you looking at in the markets? It does seem that half the people are betting that equities go up and the other half down. Good morning. Um, yeah, I mean, look, so, look. The, the latest Bank of America fund manager survey says growth and profit expectations have sunk. Goldman's data says that uh, that hedge funds have trimmed their leverage. We've had a fortnight of volatile bond yields suggesting uncertainty about Fed policy. Quality factors have been outperforming in uh, the in equity markets. So in short, investors are nervous, right? They're seeking out shelter. Now we don't entirely disagree. Yeah, since June, we've been acknowledging the risk that uh, leading economic indicators roll over, and we've been adding back a little more to growth and defence to create a barbell portfolio with value at the right. other end. Tilting to quality definitely makes sense, but we remain firmly overweight equities. You know, the risk of a recession in the next three to six months we think is low. We think the risk of a policy, monetary policy mistake is low. Right. Um, you know, we think, yeah, there, and there could be another run of the Ed, reflation trade in what September. does that... Yeah, I guess you have to get Treasuries right to get every other asset class right. What's your call on 10-year Treasury? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was talking to our, our head of fixed income research last week. You know, that neither of us have ever been more uncertain about the outlook for Treasuries, which I think is telling in itself. So that's another reason not to make too much of a binary bet, I think, at the moment, when uncertainty is high. We think that yeah, at 1.25, 1.26, the 10-year U.S. Treasury is not consistent with the economic fundamentals. There are these huge long-term structural forces pushing down on, uh, on, on rates, but not to these levels. Over the next 12 months, we're looking at getting back to around 2%. Ed, what about the dollar call? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, we still think the, the dollar is overvalued against most cross rates on a variety of valuation frameworks. Uh, yeah, whether we look at simple ones like purchasing power parity or our own sort of behavioral equilibrium uh, model, which looks at relative productivity, relative savings, relative uh, prices. Um, so, um, yeah, so there is a, you know, a long-term headwind that we think, you know, really... Um, it's only long-term currency forecasts that you can make with any real certainty because you know, they're, they're, just, uh, they're too fickle in the short term. You know, but there could be some reasons why we get a bit more dollar strength in the, in the near term if this risk-off environment right. continues or if um, uh, the, the Fed does taper slightly more aggressively, perhaps. But well, that's not our base case. Um, Ed Smith, what are you exactly expecting from Jackson Hole? So there was a nice Bloomberg scoop over the weekend. Congratulations to our team in Washington saying that it's very likely, or actually Janet Yellen has endorsed Jay Powell. That, again, a dovish Jay Powell is actually good for a lot of equities and asset classes. Um, is that, you know, one of the biggest news that could come out in the next couple of weeks, or are you actually look for some kind of policy indication at Jackson Hole? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I saw that uh, scoop on Yellen that's very interesting. I thought maybe Lyle Brainard might be the next um, uh, governor. But I think either way, Brainard or, um, or, or Chair Powell to, to continue, um, I think is, it, yeah, they're two dubs, right? So in terms of the market, I think the two tips, you know, the candidates, the continuity or the replacement are, are two dubs. Thinking about uh, Jackson Hole, yeah, we don't think we're going to get a little more information um, on the timing of, of rate hikes when Powell takes the mic on, on Friday. Maybe a bit more information about the quantum, but not so much clearer guidance on a uh, start date. You know, since the last Fed meeting, 
you know, we've had yeah, a big disappointing retail sales numbers. We've had a stalling in the ramp up of spending on services as the Delta waves um, unnerved confidence. Some stalling right. in, you know, the, the Fed may also want to wait about until we have more clarity on fiscal stimulus. We think that the Fed is, is not going to divulge too much. There's, there's still a bit too much uncertainty. Ed Smith, thank you so much. Co-Chief Investment Officer at Rathbones staying with us. Now, coming up, Joe Biden expands his evacuation from Afghanistan to the beyond the limits of Kabul airport as he faces criticism for his swift, swift withdrawal. But Chatham House Chairman Jim O'Neill says the U.S. can use the dominance of the dollar to wage a different kind of war against those supporting the Taliban. Well, he'll be joining the program in 20 minutes from now. If you have any questions for him, you can write at IB plus TV Go, or you can IB or tweet me directly at Flacqua. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm from Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First for news, here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. President Joe Biden says he may extend the August 31st deadline for a full U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. He is also promising expanded efforts to help evacuate Americans who have struggled to reach Kabul airport. Some 25,000 have been airlifted so far. There's no question there will be and should be a robust analysis of what has happened. But right now, there is no question that our focus has to be on evacuating American citizens, Afghans who worked with us, and vulnerable Afghans, including women and children. Now, China has brought local cases of COVID down to zero again. Since the news of a cluster in the eastern city of Nanjing a month ago, the country has carried out 100 million tests, imposed travel bans and enforced strict lockdowns. In Australia, Prime Minister Scott Morrison says it's highly unlikely his country will ever return to no COVID cases. He's sticking with his plan to remove virus curves when vaccination targets are indeed met. Almost a fifth of companies advertising COVID tests for travellers returning to the UK from abroad face removal from the government's list of providers. More than 80 firms will be issued a two-strike warning after the government promised to clamp down on the high costs of tests. Bloomberg estimates UK travellers have spent at least £380 million on tests in the first six months of this year. And Sweden's Prime Minister Stefan Luvian is to step down in November but after seven years in power. His unexpected announcement in a speech on Sunday could open the way for Finance Minister Magdalena Anderson to become the country's first female leader if picked at her party's Congress, which is happening in early November. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Also known as Laura Wright on Monday mornings, <laughs> where I haven't had my coffee yet. Leanne, thank you. Now, global companies are so flush with cash that they're racing to bring back dividends. According to a global study by Janice Henderson, payouts are expected to reach $1.39 trillion this year, the second highest ever tally. Now, Janice Henderson argues that the pandemic did less damage to corporate profits than expected, and a world awash with liquidity will see a lot of money of that money returned to shareholders. Let's get back to Ed Smith, co-chief investment officer of Rathbones, who's still with us. Ed, thank you so much for sticking around. How do you look at dividends, and what does it mean for sectors that you follow? Yeah, so I mean, I agree that I think dividends are likely to, to come back. I think the question over the next couple of years is, is what will corporates do with some of the, 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 the cash wall that the, the, the lucky ones have built up over the last uh, 15 months? Will they return it to shareholders directly by a dividend or buybacks? We've seen some resumption in them. Uh, or will they invest it? Yeah, will it be more about R&D, more about um, uh, yeah, uh, CapEx? Part of that might come down to f fiscal policy. 
you know, we're still waiting for the um, for the U.S. Uh, reconciliation bill. What will happen to corporation tax and that? Will there be extra incentives to uh, invest in, and do R&D? From a long-term perspective, right, and we're long-term right. investors, we would actually rather see more higher levels of R&D because companies that, that, uh, that engage in that tend to have uh, better uh, shareholder returns in the, in, in the long run. So Ed, is there a specific industry or sector that you want to be invested in because dividends means that you'll reap the rewards? Yeah, so I think banks is worth a look at. Yeah, certainly in Europe, there are a lot of restrictions that have been uh, released now. Yeah, the extent to which bank uh, dividend repayments will, will come back is still perhaps uh, in doubt. But we know that uh, banks pretty much across the board um, built up an extraordinary amount of loan loss provisions. Yeah, their, their worst case, uh, sorry, their base case scenarios for the macro outlook was far worse than it's actually uh, has been real than what's been realized in the economy. The unemployment rates that they were assuming were you know, off, off the chart in terms of uh, you know, what uh, sort of the Bloomberg consensus now, now predicts. So there's a lot of capacity right. to take those provisions, redistribute. Yeah, it's another reason why we think banks are worth a look today. Uh, do you have any investments in Bitcoin, Ed? Uh, no, uh, we don't. Part of that is for regulatory uh, reasons with our, with our sort of retail client base. But yeah, uh, yeah, some of our peers, some of the, the the fund managers we regularly talk to, yeah, we know they've been adding on sort of on asset allocation grounds. We're a bit more circumspect on some of those reasons. So some people think that they will be that Bitcoin could function like a diversifier. Well, as we've seen over the last few months, volatility is huge and it has no negative correlation with equity markets. So right. it's going to add to your portfolio risk. Some people think it's digital gold, but it doesn't correlate mm -hmm. with gold. It doesn't correlate with inflation. So again, like yeah, perhaps Bitcoin might start to exhibit these attributes over time, but it's not today. So that's a bit of a speculative hunt. Right. Ed, thanks so much. Ed Smith there, co-chief investment officer at Rathbones, joining us this morning. Coming up, just five weeks before Election Day in Germany, and polls show that Angela Merkel's preferred successor, Armin Laschet, failing to impress voters. We'll have that full story next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, with just over a month to go before Germany's general election, the latest polls show support for Chancellor Angela Merkel's party, the CDU, and its affiliate, the CSU, has slumped to an all-time low. Meanwhile, the Social Democrats have risen to an almost four-year high. Well, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo joins me now from Berlin. Maria, good morning. So the campaign officially starting, the CDU, in a precarious spot, can lash it make it? Yes, uh, Francine, in, in a very precarious spot, I would say the CDU has been in free fall now for weeks when it looks at, when you look at polls. And the thing here when you look at those numbers is that the trend has not fully stopped. This is not just a question of them not being able to sustain momentum. This is about the CDU not being able to prevent further declines. When you look at the SPD, it's a very different situation. When you look at the individual candidates, Armin Laschet is in much bigger trouble than the party. This is someone who really has not been able to capture uh, the attention from Germans. If anything, he's not been able to recover from criticism about the management of the floods when he got caught giggling. And this is something that still continues very much to haunt him. Now, Francine, over the weekend, we did get the big party event kicking off the campaign from the CDU. The card that they're playing now is that they have the experience. They also said, look, we're sexy and solid. Some will tell you Christian Democrats, perhaps sexy and solid is not the way to uh, describe them. And if you vote for Schultz, what you're going to get is a very left-wing coalition that will <laughs> undo everything we've done for Germany. So they're not really playing the fear card. You're not voting for Olaf Schultz. You're voting for a socialist coalition that will come together after the election. So, Maria, the two-party coalition was a base case. Is it no longer? 
Yes, and you know, Francine, that's a very good point because especially in markets, the idea was that we were going to see the CDU in autopilot into the next government, that the Greens would join in, and this was almost like the sweet spot. It was climate and capital coming together. When you look at polls now, CDU, SPD, they're polling 22% each. The Greens are not able to go past 18. It does seem that they have peaked and they're really not able to capture further uh, votes. So overall, you could look at a situation where this is not just a two-party coalition, but would actually need a third one to prop up the government. But what is also key is that Germany could go both ways. You could have the CDU leading what could be perhaps a green center-right coalition or actually really go left with the SPD now in government for the first time in 16 years. Maria, thank you so much. I'm Maria today there with the very latest, of course, on Germany and the election close by. Now, coming up, we consider whether the Taliban's victory over the world's most powerful military will have any implications for the dollar and its role in the world. Chatham House Chair Jim O'Neill joins me next on the program. If you have any questions for him, you can write in IB plus TV Go or tweet me directly at Flacqua. This is Bloomberg. Dip buying ahead of Jackson Hole sees stocks and futures climb, Bitcoin breaking above $50,000 for the first time since May. Angela Merkel's CDU slums to an all-time low in the polls a month away from Germany's election while she pushes for sanctions against Russia if Nord Stream 2 is used as a weapon. And President Biden expands the U.S. evacuation efforts in Afghanistan beyond Kabul airport amid criticism of his decision to push ahead with withdrawal. Will G7 leaders meet virtually tomorrow? Good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Monday, the 23rd of August. So this is what we're looking at for the S&P 500 futures. I know it's one of the rhetorics that we've been talking about quite a lot, but I have to say there was a really compelling Bloomberg piece on the markets saying that the widest range between S&P uh, predictions for the lowest and the highest, it, th that it's the widest range in three decades, and it goes to the anxiousness in the markets, which could also lead to choppier markets in the next couple of weeks. Traders taking off maybe last week's sell-off uh, to take advantage and buy the dip while keeping a very wary eye on the Delta virus strains in China's regulatory crackdown. Now, President Biden says he may extend the August 31st deadline for a full withdrawal from Afghanistan. He's also promising expanded efforts to help evacuate Americans who have struggled to reach Kabul airport. Meanwhile, Afghanistan's exiled central bank chief has warned that the new Taliban-led government is facing a potential economic crisis. Ajmal Ahmadi told Bloomberg that the new government could turn to other countries for financing. They're going to have to find additional revenue sources, uh, or, or wherever that may be. They'll probably try to go out to you know, other countries to replace the U.S. and maybe China, Pakistan, or other regional countries to find um, some sources of financing. So what, if any, are the implications of the Taliban victory over the world's most powerful military and the largest economy on the U.S. dollar and dominant role of global currency? Well, to answer this and more, we're joined by Jim O'Neill, economist, a senior advisor at Chatham House and former U.K. commercial secretary to the Treasury. He has just penned an article on this po topic for Project Syndicate. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, I, you had a beautiful piece actually laying out, I guess, what Afghanistan shows the world that the U.S. could do, you link it to the dollar, and of course you talk about Bretton Woods. Underlying all of this is, I guess, the future of the dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, Francine. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's obviously a big moment in uh, at least the geopolitics <clears throat> of these issues, um, uh, and many people's instincts, uh, and some of mine would be to think, well, this has got to be bad news for the dollar, but all you need to do is spend half an hour reflecting on uh, the original uh, Afghan uh, invasion 20 years ago, Iraq, and many others. And of course, the dollar has, has not only survived uh, easily all of those episodes, it, throughout many of them, the initial instinct of the dollar was to rise as sort of a bit of a mini sort of safe haven kind of thing comes into existence. And it, and it, it obviously, <clears throat> nothing ever takes place in a vacuum because there's other things going on, but that seems so far to have what, 
what's happened again in this case. Jim, do you think King Dollar will really be challenged in the next five years? So the other thing that I touch on in that piece, which is uh, it's very interesting that I don't, don't hear or read anybody talking about it, but I think I'm right in saying, Fran, you get your colleagues to check this out because it wouldn't be the first time I'm wrong about something, but I think I'm right in saying that this month the IMF will... Uh, will publish its uh, five-year review of the, the components of the SDR baskets. And one would imagine, um, although <laughs> that's a bit dangerous to say by normal circumstances, that the RMB weight in the uh, SDR basket might rise again. And uh, contrary to what I just said, if that were the case, um, that would serve to remind people that as we creep through time, uh, on an objective representation of the importance of currencies linked to their economies and trade, the RMB is picking up pace despite its, uh, its apparent uh, loss of interest in markets the past couple of years and, of course, with what China's doing. So I think that will be very interesting to see, actually. And as I say, I'm surprised there's not any chatter in the markets about it. Maybe there is, and I've just not noticed it. Yeah, I mean, is, is there a worry, actually, Jim, that markets are too short-termist? So, you know, some of these longer-term <laughs> implication for foreign... Never! Markets short-termist? How dare you say that? Um, but is it, you know, more short-term than it was it, two, three years it. ago? <laughs> you know, it, it does... Uh, I mean, I, you know, obviously these days I, I am a bit removed... Uh, from the hurly-burly of day-to-day -day markets uh, compared to much of my professional life. And it, it actually does often seem to me from where I sit that markets seem remarkably focused on such short-term events and, and sometimes uh, don't really have a, a lot of perspective. I, I quickly add in saying that, uh, having, having learnt my spurs in the foreign exchange market, the foreign exchange market is the greatest fruit and vegetable stall in the world and it, and it has this uncanny ability to absorbing and digesting everything that everybody knows very quickly so foreign exchange markets probably pretty better pretty good compared with virtually any market in having a reasonable reflection of a price about what everybody's thinking about so uh, we'll see but obviously the other thing we've got jackson hole uh, even though i think yeah. it's now going to be virtual and what, and what the Fed has to say about tapering, I would imagine, is obviously going to be pretty relevant for the performance of the dollar and broader markets as well. Yeah, and we were looking at, you know, the, the spread between the people that actually think that markets or the S&P 500 goes up and the ones that think it, go, it goes down. And the divergence is actually absolutely incredible. It's a little bit like the divergence mm. on Treasury calls. Jim, I mean, what does that point to? <laughs> Um, I, I heard you say that and, and sort of found it interesting. Um, it's not surprising in a way. I mean, if you think that uh, historically late August through early October have often been some of the most chaotic markets in uh, repeatedly over the years, certainly over my near 40 years, we have got lots of things that we even know about that, that could cause... Uh, that again this September and October. So, you know, whether whether it's from uh, Taliban, uh, Taliban controlled Afghanistan getting out of complete control and mayhem, uh, mm. the Fed deciding to taper more aggressively, or Delta variant getting, you know, there's all sorts of things that can cause a lot of turmoil just amongst what we know. Uh, and then actually there's the Afghanistan thing as reminders about there could be something completely unknown suddenly appears on top of all of this cocktail too. So I wouldn't be in the slightest bit surprised myself if we had a pretty volatile few weeks coming up. Mm. Jim, do you believe that, you know, a policy mistake, the worst policy mistake would actually the Fed and other central banks not acting quickly enough on inflation? I'm actually slightly the other way. I think it's, uh, you know, linked to what I just said. The Fed's got, as often, a, a very tricky environment. The, some, of the, some of the issues that people have talked about so much in recent weeks about inflation uh, have obviously got some basis. But at the same time, 
Uh, it, it seems to me longer term measures of inflation expectations, as you and I discussed before, particularly the the University of Michigan one, as it relates to the states, have all you know seem quite stable to me. And uh, yeah. and if we're going to uh, see more evidence of the world economy slowing down again, because we've certainly seen that during this month, um, it might well be that the inflation fears yet again turn out to be overstated. So. If I were a voting member of the Fed, I'd be trying to look through this for the foreseeable future, and, and particularly with the the spread of the the Delta variant, wanting wanting to make sure that this thing isn't yet again going to cause fresh destruction for economic developments in so many parts of the world. Jim, thank you so much. I thought of you over the weekend, Jim. Actually, I went to a, a football match, learned loads of new swear ah. words. We'll talk about football as well. Which Jim game? What game was it you went to? Fulham Hall. It was it was a friendly game. Jim O'Neill stays with us. We'll talk a lot more about China and emerging markets and maybe football as well, because we just can't stay away from football. Coming up, President Xi lays out a warning for China's rich rhetoric from Beijing points to a campaign to close the nation's massive wealth gap. We'll discuss China next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the Chinese President Xi Jinping has laid out a warning for a country's rich. His rhetoric about common prosperity has surged this year, evidence of the Communist Party's commitment to closing China's widening wealth gap. Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Kern, now joins us from Hong Kong. So, Enda, good morning to you. What's the significance of the use of common prosperity? Well, good morning, Francine. It does appear to be emerging now as something that we do need to keep a closer eye on. This phrase, common prosperity, only appeared sporadically in President Xi's speeches early on. But in the past year, it has appeared 65 times compared to 30 times in the year before that my colleagues in Beijing have worked out. So it does show you that we are getting something of a new signal now from the central government in terms of where their priorities are. And this idea of common prosperity goes to the core of more equality for all, tackling the high the high earners not just the ultra rich but those who are also the high earners too and it does seem as though the, the government is determined now to send a signal that they are about uh, you know leveling up the society for want of a better word and that there will be some policy changes coming down coming down the tracks so what kind of policy options are the government actually looking at Inda? Well, it's, you know, it's early stages. We're getting the signals on this, uh, you know, in recent weeks. But the idea seems to be, on the one hand, there's a discussion around philanthropy, which means big companies will need to start donating more money to the causes that the government think they should be putting money into. And on the other side of the ledger, of course, there's going to be some discussion around tax. We've had some signals coming from the party that tax will be on the agenda. And we know also that the, you know, the state press are making this point as well, that uh, people are going to have to be aware that change is coming and that those high earners are going to have to be willing to share a little bit of their, of their dues. So, as I say, we don't have policy specifics yet, but all the indications are that there will be some measures and those measures will focus on tax and philanthropy, Francine. Thank you so much, uh, Bloomberg's Enda Kern there with the very latest on China. Now let's get back to Jim O'Neill. Jim, we were talking a little bit about China, you know, with Enda and trying to really mm. figure out what comes next in terms of regulation. Now, this is nothing new, right? They, they've wanted a fairer society for a long time. Maybe they were sidetracked by the trade war with the U.S. But is that a good way, a good, a good prism of looking China? I mean, you coined the BRICS. What's next? <laughs> um... Hmm, I don't, you know, I'm watching it with great interest and trying to read about it as much as I can. I'm, I, I, I'm a bit concerned about whether the Chinese machine has, has balanced its judgment of the timing of this. And I, I, obviously, one can get, given what they are, why they, 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 at some point they have to do something about narrowing the income and wealth gap. But at the same time as when there's so many other issues swirling, particularly, you know, going back to what we talked about before in terms of big picture and longer term, you know, we've entered the time where China's uh, labor force is peaking. 
And so that some of the forces that drive underlying long-term growth for China aren't anything like as favorable as they were. And, and coming on top of when there's such a battle about aspects of global trade involving China, you know, where's their productivity going to come from if they're going to keep on clamping down on a variety of different sectors, whether it's linked to a genuine desire to narrow the wealth gap or not? And so, you know, I, I'm a bit concerned that they might they might not handle this correctly. Now, I quickly add in saying that, you know, when others have worried about things the Chinese are doing the past 30 years, they've always been wrong. The Chinese seemingly get it right. Uh, but this this is a, a more tricky time for them to do these things than, in my view, than it's been in any of the past uh, certainly 20 years of BRICS and probably earlier. So it's going to be fascinating to, to watch. And as we can see, not surprisingly, the markets are, are very focused on it. But do you think, Jim, this is be, a concern it's for... And they should, it is important, but is this a concern for international investors or is this a, you know, a concern actually for the Chinese economy? Uh, both. Uh, you know, Linked to the whole brick thing, um, still amazingly, so few people seem to really get it. But what happens to the Chinese economy at the margin is the single most important thing in the world economy, whether you are directly invested in China or not. Uh, China has marginally uh, added more to global growth than the United States uh, in the past two decades. And if China screws it, screws things up, and the economy slows sharply and, and more even worse than that if it were to be in a disruptive way it would be really bad for the world economy uh for everyone uh and so obviously for the markets it's really important jim we have a viewer question actually which is interesting which is kind of foreign affairs but also linking it back uh to the economy yeah. so this person writes in what's jim's view of the impact of afghanistan on taiwan security either physical or economic security. Right. I mean, uh, I, I sort of share what I think is the sort of general quick view about all of this, that uh, if you look, look at the style in which the U.S. appears to have just disappeared from a leadership role in Afghanistan, I can't imagine uh, the likes of China are going to be overly worried about, you know, a lot of the rhetoric that the U.S. says about Taiwan. Um, because when it comes to it, you know, we're going. Uh, what's really driven uh, Biden, it seems to me, is the is the domestic politics in the United States, and the domestic appetite in the U.S., rightly or wrongly, for this never-ending U.S. engagement in deep, uh, distant places in the world is is has gone down a lot, and so. Whilst to the to the international elite involved in these issues in the U.S., Taiwan obviously represents a massive issue for most American people. They probably couldn't care less. So, the idea that the U.S. would do something really substantial to defend Taiwan, I I, I, I always found it a bit hard to believe. And certainly, I think the evidence after Afghanistan is that others will as well. Uh, and as we as we all know, or well, certainly people who followed China a long time. You know, the Taiwan issue is something that the Chinese leadership, rightly or wrongly, regards as a, a domestic issue because it relates to their own history. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, they would, well, if it came to it, the Chinese would, would, would be prepared to do a lot of things to, to support what they think is theirs. And I, I can't see the commitment from the U.S. being that strong when it, when it really came to it, although obviously... In the, in the global geopolitics of it, the U.S. rhetoric on Taiwan will remain very, very strong. Jim, thank you so much. We haven't even talked about football. Any, are you planning to go to any stadiums no, anytime you go. Too, well, too many? Maybe if post, Manchester United maybe... play as abysmally as they did yesterday, I might not go ever again. We're supposed to be a good team <laughs> these days, but yesterday was pretty dire. Yeah, but it, I, I won't believe that, Jim, best leave, if I believe that. Best that from, maybe. I'll, I'll, be, I'll <laughs> no, believe I'll be anything, which I don't. Yeah. 
<laughs> Jim, thank you so much, Jim O'Neill there from Chatham House. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Bloomberg has learned that Janet Yellen has told senior White House advisors that she supports reappointing Jerome Powell as Federal Reserve Chair. The White House has been casting a wide net for possible candidates, with Powell's four-year term set to end in February. The U.S. Treasury Secretary's backing would greatly increase Powell's chance of reappointment. Now, shares in China Evergrande have fallen on a report that it may sell its Hong Kong headquarters building at a loss. Singtao Daily reports a debt-laden developer could get 10.5 billion Hong Kong dollars for the office tower, less than the 12.5 billion it did buy it for back in 2015. And that's your Bloomberg a Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Now, coming up, Bitcoin briefly tops the $50,000 level for the first time since May, in it, and it recovers from a disorderly rout just three months ago. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, this is a picture for the markets on this Monday morning. Stocks in Europe rising, U.S. futures also on the up. Traders taking advantage of last week's sell-off while keeping a wary eye on risks from the Delta variant strain and China's regulatory crackdown. I'm looking at also bonds, they're declining. Now, some of the recent weakness in commodities, for example, abated. Uh, oil pushing past $63 a barrel. Some of the commodity-linked currencies, like the Australian dollar, also strengthened. And Bitcoin, the big story today, we're going to have an update shortly, I think, with one of our reporters on Bitcoin retaking $50,000 for the first time since mid-May. Now, it's very interesting to see that, um, you know, some of the things out there, the Dallas Fed president, for example, Robert Kaplan, says he's open to adjusting his view that the Fed should start tapering its asset purchase program sooner rather than later if the Delta strain persists and hurts economic progress. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen also, in a Bloomberg scoop, actually endorsed Jay Powell for a second term as Fed chair a move that could reduce uncertainty about the path for monetary policy. Now, joining us to talk about uh, cryptocurrency and to talk about Bitcoin is Joanna Ossinger. Joanna, thank you so much for joining us. So if you look at Bitcoin back above 50,000, I mean, the rally was actually, you know, pretty extraordinary or it happened quite fast. So what brought it back up? I don't know if we do have Joanna on the phone. We may have Joanna, we may not have Joanna. Maybe we have Joanna, but uh, she's on mute. It's a very 2021 thing to say. Look, on the virus front, China also uh, squelched some local COVID cases down to zero. And then we're looking at Australia and New Zealand reviewing some of their strategies by eliminating infections. Well, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller joins me out of Berlin. Actually, he's off today. So it will be Lisa Bramovitz and Kelly Lines out of New York. York. Both of them join me shortly. This is Bloomberg. Delta is the the ace card that Jay Powell can pull out of the sleeve uh, if he wants to slow up his committee. The COVID-19 uh, Delta flare-up maybe wasn't in the same place. So they sounded like Chuck Norris back then. But, you know, today, I think, I, I don't think they're going to strike the same tone uh, in Jackson Hole. I don't expect the Fed to taper this year that many people are thinking. And B, even if they do, I don't think that would be bad for the market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. Well, it's 10 a.m. here in London and 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Monday, August 23rd, our top stories today. Looking for clarity from Wall Street? Well, the experts are just as baffled about the markets as they were last year. This week's Jackson Hole Symposium may provide guidance. Here comes Bitcoin. The largest cryptocurrency is back over 50,000 after a 72% rally since last month. 
and a crucial test for President Biden's economic agenda. He's counting on Nancy Pelosi to keep House Democrats in lockstep this week. Meanwhile, the president's still dealing with the fallout from Afghanistan. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Kaylee Lines and Lisa Bramovitz in New York. Matt Miller is actually off today. Kaylee, we look at the markets a little bit supported, but we could see choppiness just because of the divergence of views on what happens next to the S&P 500. Yeah, and of course, we're all waiting and watching for Jackson Hole later on this week, Francine. But even ahead of that, we did see a pretty strong rebound in the Asian session. Equities really higher across the board, green all across the screen on Matt Markets Go. Your outperformance coming from Japan with the Nikkei up about 1.8%, but stocks were higher in China and Hong Kong. And specifically, Chinese tech stocks finally getting some relief. The Hang Seng Tech Index hit a record low on Friday. Friday amid fears around regulatory crackdowns, and yet it rebounded about 2% today. Yes, those fears haven't necessarily gone away, but maybe just some buying of the dip is taking shape. We also got economic data out of South Korea overnight. Strong exports, that gave a lift to the Kospi and also a lift to the South Korean won, the biggest outperformer in Asian FX, stronger against the U.S. dollar by about half of 1%, bouncing off of an 11-month low. Also, in FX, you're seeing some strength in the commodity currencies, including the Aussie dollar, which is stronger against the greenback by about half of 1%. All right, Kaylee. As for what the picture looks like in Lisa, or in Europe, Lisa, really quickly, I just want to run you through it. There's a lot of green on the continent as well. Stocks are higher really across the board. The DAX up a tenth, and then your outperformance actually is coming from the CAC 40 in Paris, higher by about six tenths of 1%. And overall, the stock 600 higher now by about three tenths. One individual equity story I did want to point to is Sainsbury, of course, the UK grocer. It is up about 11, nearly 12% on reports that a private equity firm, Apollo, is looking at a takeover bid for that company. And then finally, the euro uh, is stronger against the dollar by about a quarter of 1%. Broadly, it is a story of dollar weakness today. And then also a lift in the commodity complex. Uh, Brent crude up about 3% after its worst week since October. It's trading at 67.35, Lisa. All right. Well, I jumped the gun because I'm just so excited that everybody's back buying the dip today. Because that seems to be the mood on the street after last week's dip, if you can call it even a dip. People are coming back in. There's a risk on tone. You can blame it or attribute it to whatever you want. But the bottom line is you can't keep a market down with a Fed that is going to remain dovish. And yes, the Jackson Hole Symposium, I don't know if we can call it that anymore considering the fact that it's now virtual, is going to probably come out and reiterate comments that we heard last week that people are getting more concerned about the Delta variant. The S&P now up about a quarter of a percent. The 10-year yield a little bit higher, but again well off the 1.6 percent levels that we saw back in early June at 1.27 percent. The dollar weakness, as Kaylee was saying, across the board. And crude, really interesting to get this lift. We saw Goldman Sachs come out and say that they thought that it was over sold because the Delta variant is transitory, if we want to bring that word back. Let's resurrect it, Fran. Yeah, let's do that, Lisa. I also love the fact it is a, a virtual symposium, or we could call it the silent disco at Jackson Hole. The now let's take a look at what disco. else is ahead today. Yeah, the U.S. House returns to Washington today for a vote on the Senate's budget resolution. Tomorrow, uh, Kamala Harris arrives in Vietnam, becoming the first U.S. vice president to visit since 1975. On Thursday, the Fed officials meet virtually for the annual Jackson Hole Economic Policy Symposium. That's what Lisa was talking about. And then we'll get July U.S. personal income and spending data on Friday. So it's all about Jackson Hole. And, of course, that nice Bloomberg scoop, Kaylee, that uh, Janet Yellen is also for keeping Jay Powell for the moment, which actually means that we could have a bit more continuity on monetary policy. Yeah, which could be a good thing for investors. And let's get more on investor expectations ahead of Thursday's Jackson Hole meeting. Let's bring in out Bloomberg's Creedy Gupta. So, Creedy, how exactly is the mar market positioned ahead of the event? Well, Kaylee, everything has to do with the market action you saw last week. We've really had this kind of risk-off week, but it was really about the FOMC minutes. We know we've been hearing from several Fed officials for months now that they are starting to look for tapering, especially going into the end of this year, perhaps in just a couple of months by the end of December. That confirmation showed up in the FOMC minutes last Wednesday. So you did see that dip for about three days in a row. But compare this to the 2013 taper tantrum you saw with Chairman Bernanke, and this was not the same reaction. So at first, people are thinking, well, hold on a second. Maybe the market isn't that sensitive to tapering. But then fast forward to Friday, and immediately you saw that buy the dip mentality when Chairman, uh, excuse me, I should say Dallas Fed President Kaplan came out and actually said, we should be looking looking 
at potentially the Delta variant in terms of the tapering timeline, because that could really change just how quickly we want to scale back those bond purchases. Now, Kaylee, this is significant simply because uh, Kaplan was one of the first people to come out and say that he is actually in favor of tapering and starting off that process of cutting back the Fed support. So a little bit of a mixed market reaction. Looks like a little bit muted to the downside, but the upside surprise when it comes to that Fed support, well, it's no secret that that's what uh, is supported markets on Friday and, of course, futures this morning as well. Can you give us a sense, Creedy, of what tapering means in light of what we're experiencing with respect to the Delta variant? I mean, honestly, it seems like that slows the economy. The taper response might be slightly different than otherwise. It absolutely is. And you know, the, what's important here is that when you start to look at the Fed's balance sheet and you look at the S&P 500, for example, they basically track each other. So it's no secret here that the market is a little bit addicted to the Fed support. I mean, it's no secret. But you're actually seeing this in the charting itself. The question here is how much further can it go when a lot of this kind of downside surprise is arguably baked into the market. And that's really what you're going to see with Jackson Hole. A lot of investors saying, well, the surprise for Jackson Hole, what was in the rare view mirror? Some traders I spoke to even saying they're taking this week off because they don't even expect anything to happen. Like you guys said in the intro, the, uh, the big surprise here was Janet Yellen giving his support to Chairman Powell. There you go. August, beach week. Everybody, just go to the beach and forget the markets. Kriti, thanks so much. Kriti Gupta. Now, commodity markets are set for a high-stakes week. The Jackson Hole meeting will be a spotlight as tapering concerns royal prices. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Manus Kranian. And Manus, we've seen a lot of commodity prices and stocks that go with it really weep sod. Yeah, I mean, look, the commodities came under incredible pressure last week. There's a word in my inbox, Francine, it's existential angst. And really last week saw a repricing in the dollar at a multi-month high. That impacted the commodity. The commodity, uh, Bloomberg Commodity Index rolled over and rolled down. The big protagonists within that commodity complex are, of course, oil, which is 15% of the BCOM, uh, gold and copper. Iron ore had its own moment in the sun. But I think what you've moved from here is the two E's. Existential angst last week was repriced the dollar, repriced commodities and equities through to an excuse, which is the Kaplan lines. He wants agility, open-mindedness, and he wants to avoid rigidity. That opens a more nuanced taper. That has a consequence for the dollar, and that has a symbiotic relationship with where the commodity complex goes. You've got the worst mm. month since COVID began mm. on the commodity complex. The question now yeah. is whether you're putting in a flaw in China and whether mm. the dollar will continue to roll, on, roll over and a more nuanced taper could come into play. Fran. Well, Manis, you're talking about commodities and currencies there, and maybe Bitcoin is a little bit of both. I don't really know what we call it at this point, but it's back above 50,000. What's driving it? Uh, I suppose a relief, a sense of relief. You know, if you think of all the analyst notes, it was $20,000 and we're going to have a major implosion. Michael Burry uh, talking about an implosion the size of economies. Here you are. Um, Fibonacci. We like a bit of Fibonacci. 61.8% retracement takes you back to $51,000 from the highs to the lows. So we are back on a technical retracement towards that level. The record high was $65,000. So you are just seeing a renaissance in terms of risk taking uh, and a steadying in the market. So what you have here is a rapid repricing in Bitcoin for any number of reasons. But you will start to see the buy notes come flooding through your inbox talking about $100,000 again. Just wait for uh, Lord Elon to proclaim. I'm sure we can rustle up a bit of vol on Bitcoin when he does. Thank you so much. Bloomberg's Manus Cranny had to predict the volatility ahead in Bitcoin. Over in Washington, D.C., uh, what President Biden yesterday saying that the U.S. had expanded its evacuation efforts beyond the perimeter of the Kabul airport. It is working hard to get people out. Take a listen. Let me be clear. The evacuation of thousands of people from Kabul is going to be hard and painful no matter when it started, when we began. It would have been true if we had started a month ago or a month from now. There is no way to evacuate this many people without pain and loss of heartbreaking images you see on television. It's just a fact. And Maria Hordurin also waking up early with us, Bloomberg Washington correspondent joining from our D.C. Bureau. And Maria, can you give us a sense of the response to the pushback that President Biden has given in terms of what the U.S. role has been, the timetable and how this evacuation has proceeded? 
Well, there's a lot of question marks regarding the timetable exactly. We, the president kind of left ov open the August 31st deadline, and we know that tomorrow, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, when he convenes the virtual G7, this is something he's going to be pushing forward. We should note that just in the last few minutes, the Times of London is reporting that the Taliban does not agree and will not sign up for an extension of that August 31st deadline. So this is where things could get, get potentially tricky. The president's speech, the other thing to note that is uh, of importance is that he did say the U.S. is expanding these efforts um, to help evacuate Americans that cannot get to the airport, but he wouldn't give the tactical changes and the reasoning exactly behind this because of security reasons. But there are reports that the likes of the ambassador of Qatar is going with Americans and actually escorting them to the airport to make sure they can get there to safety. So as the president said, it is a very tricky um, and dangerous operation, but we do know that they are expanding that operation outside the airport, and yeah. we do know that at the moment that August 31st deadline does remain a little bit elusive. While we're talking about deadlines and timelines, Anne-Marie, we also have the House taking a small break from their recess today, coming back to Capitol Hill to take steps forward on President Biden's economic agenda. What takes place today and through the remainder of the week? Well, Speaker Pelosi wants to get through three agenda items. One is the voting rights legislation. One is the framework for the $3.5 trillion budget uh, resolution. And finally, the bipartisan infrastructure agreement. Now, she wants to put them all through procedurally, but the only one that, the only two that would get the actual vote would be the resolution as well as the voting rights. Now, this is set up for a very delicate balancing act. Already late last night, you had nine uh, moderate Democrats penning a letter all together in the Washington Post, an opinion piece saying the time to act on infrastructure is now <clears throat> and we should not be holding it hostage. Uh, it remains to be seen if these nine moderates are willing to tank the budget resolution if yep. they don't get their bipartisan infrastructure. Uh, but, but tomorrow will be key votes. All right, Anne-Marie Hordern in Washington, thank you so much. And I do want to take a quick check now on some stocks moving in free market trading here in the U.S. One of them moving to the upside is Pfizer. Of course, the COVID-19 vaccine maker. Currently, that vaccine only has emergency use authorization, but we're expecting the FDA to grant it full approval as early as today. And as a result, those shares up about 3% before the bell. To the downside, though, one stock is Uber. You had a judge in California striking down a voter-approved ballot measure, Proposition 22, which allowed... Uh, companies to classify their drivers as independent contractors. That getting struck down, not necessarily a good thing for the likes of Uber and Lyft, and as a result, those shares down the better part of 4% before the bell. And another stock moving to the downside is GM. We got news after the bell on Friday that it's recalling all remaining 2019 Chevy Bolt EVs, as well as all models 2020 to 2022 because of a battery defect. That is dragging on that stock down a little more than 2% in early hours, Francine. Yeah, we'll look at General Motors. We also have a great note by Alberto Gallo calling it the last dance in Paradise City. And the way he says it, Kaylee, is everything in life is transitory. Duration, however, is what matters. So we'll be speaking to Alberto Gallo, Algebra's head of macro strategies. And then a little bit later, we talk COVID with Andrew Pekosh, John Hopkins, a Bloomberg School of Public Health professor and virologist. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Lisa Abramowitz in New York and Francine Lacqua in London. Matt Miller is off today. Well, guys, there was a great story out on the Bloomberg Terminal over the weekend about just how divided and unsure Wall Street strategists are as to where the S&P 500 is going to end the year. Of course, the index has already rallied about 19% on a year-to-date basis, up to around 44-41. That already is above the average year-end target on the street. The average target is 43.35, so a little bit lower than where we were as of Friday's close. But the most bullish target is all the way up at 4,700. And our listeners on London DAB Digital, I know you can't see this chart, but that basically is just above where we are now and is very much above the lowest, most bearish target on the street, which is all the way down at 3,800. The gap between those two is 24%, and that is the widest or the third widest in about a decade. Kate Francine. 
I mean, that's quite a long time. And Marcus Ashworth was like a baby in nappies 10 years ago. He joins us now. He's a Bloomberg opinion columnist, also looking dapper for a Monday morning in a full suit and tie. If you look at Kaylee's chart, and it's a fantastic chart, we've seen it for a while. It's basically the markets are, are, are you know, unsure about how they should look at the data. They're looking at the same data points. How difficult is it to, to make a call on whether it goes up or down? Well, it's quite clear the Federal Reserve doesn't know what to do, and, and they'll be struggling this week in Jackson Hole. So all of these things are uh, up in the air at the moment. There's certainly the Delta variant is making it very, very difficult, almost impossible to know whether or not there will be uh, renewed growth. I, personally, I think it's paradise postponed, not paradise lost. But we saw the, that, that down revision from Goldman Sachs, quite a savage down revision for this quarter. Um, things are getting hit. Global growth, you can just look at industrial commodities off sharply. There are clearly things which are struggling with us. However, we're going to hit the plateau, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> we, are. we hope. <laughs> yeah, we hope. Well, Marcus, of course, we're awaiting any kind of clues we may get from Fed Chairman Jerome Powell later on this week. Do we have any clues as to what the taper tantrum could like look like this time around? Well, I think they, they absolutely do not want. They have waking nightmares about what happened in 2013. There's no way they want to have that happen again. So I think, personally, uh, fascinating that it may be uh, a, a virtual symposium with no uh, foreign central bankers of any note there either. I think this is a pass this week. We might get some more information about what they really think about underemployment, what do they think about things like, uh, you know, growth prospects? But really, I think we'll pass through to September 22nd FOMC and maybe even November 1 with regards to actual tapering. However, they've got to sort of lay out some form of schedule on what they think, whether or not they'll keep the balance between, say, uh, $80 billion per month of buying of treasuries and $40 billion of, of mortgage-backed securities. Personally, yeah. I think mortgage-backed security buying is crackers at the moment. Why do that? <laughs> Marcus, I think a lot of people uh, have actually expressed similar sentiment, uh, perhaps using different words depending on their location. I wonder if there's a message <laughs> on a broader level, if you take a look at last week's entire six-tenths of a percentage point dip in the S&P and the fact that that is a buying opportunity for so many individuals, as you see this morning in the action. What is the message, if anything, from that? I'm not sure there's anything. It's, it's a summer month. The fact that the, the S&P doesn't really want to dip, I suppose must tell you all, which is the simple message it has been for so long. Equities are the only answer. You know, with bond yields down so low, you really, there's no value there whatsoever in, in bond markets. Commodities are, are struggling a bit at the moment. Equities still remain mm. the only game in town. And probably, if the Fed carries on dithering over whether it's going to taper or not, they are absolutely set fair, I think. Do you actually say it's crackers? I love it's it. crackers. I, don't, I, don't. I was thinking of another word, but I thought I thought it'd probably be safer to go uh, with um, bonkers. Was really all I wanted to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's bonkers. I guess the problem <laughs> is that there's a lot of cash out there, right? So it depends on whether equities or some of these companies distribute dividends or not. Yeah, I mean, there's so much money out there. That's why you can see bond yields so low. You can see uh, the fact that the money keeps on going into equities. So, yeah, I, I still think the balance is, is set fair for equities and, and dividend yields. And look, the quarter, the, the, the earnings season was fantastic. So, you know, the economy is going well. And there's a lot of cash money. If you look at the fiscal numbers throughout most of the economies, yeah. particularly UK as well as Europe, the fiscal numbers are holding up. Well, forget retail sales. That's not telling yeah. people are actually spending. Yeah, still. it's just the, the delta and then the crackdown in China. We should do like a pros and cons. And every day there's one that goes from one list of pros to cons. Marcus Ashworth there of Bloomberg Opinion joining us this morning. Now, coming up, the former New York Fed president and Bloomberg Opinion columnist Bill Dudley. That's at 7.30 a.m. in New York, 12.30 p.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg. Crackers. <laughs> I love that. Tell you what's crackers, Pictay. Stuff I couldn't write in the last two. Pictay's crackers. Yeah. What's going on inside that? A lot more to come out of that, by the way. Um, I'm chasing Mark Pictay quite aggressive. Well, I'll give you a call later. He won't tell you anything. If I come break for you, so my secret's growing fever, lots of things going on in the US. What do you think? More? More probes. More? On transfer tax stuff. All the power bank's going to get. But basically, Pictay the last to, to disclose the US. Wow. Thanks, Marcus. <clears throat> Do we have time for a quick chat? <clears throat> Cool. 
You know, Scarlett Johansson okay. just had a cool. baby with Colin Jost. His name is Cosmo. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not a celebrity un unless you have a weird you know, baby. You're name. not a real celebrity. Yeah. yeah. Apple. Apple. Cosmo. <laughs> I actually like Cosmo. In, I mean, in Italian, there's a name called Cosimo, which is quite, which, Cosimo. um. It's like Quasimodo. Cosimo, yeah, which is quite cool. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I made Jack watch all wedding related movies this weekend to get in Love the spirit. It. What did so you watch? Good. We watched The Princess Bride, which is my all-time fave. Yeah, and, so good. And uh, Bride Wars. Yeah. And that was it. I was trying to get him to watch Bridesmaids, so but he wouldn't. Wait, my all-time favorite is the one with, um, what's his name? Oh, God. Yeah. Steve Martin. Oh, Father Thank of you? the Bride. Oh, yeah. The Father of the Bride. That's, I mean, he's so funny. He's so, so funny. What's the one with Hugh Grant? That's like... Oh, Four Weddings and a Funeral. That's yeah, yeah. Also Four so Weddings funny. and a Funeral. Oh, I don't think yeah. I've seen that one. You've never seen that one? Mm -mm. You've never <gasps> seen that? Oh, Kaylee, you have oh, to see Kaylee. it. Oh, <laughs> Kaylee. The disappointment. It's, you have not lived. <laughs> I mean, really, it's you so haven't funny. lived. Let's, let's be honest here. <laughs> That one you need to see. Okay, well, Lisa, to I hope list. it's aged well. Has it? I need to rewatch it. Yeah, I watched it pretty recently, actually. It was, it's great. It's, it's well. really okay. good. I watched Notting Hill recently. Really? That's very funny. Yeah, it's very, very funny. I actually watched for the first time Goodwill Hunting. It's not related. You know, at I've all. never seen It's so. It's, good. You know, I've never. is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Lisa Abramowitz in New York and Francine Lacqua in London. Now let's get the first word news and her tropical storm, no longer a hurricane Henri, soaked the U.S. Northeast with rain after coming ashore in Rhode Island. The storm left a trail of power outages from New Jersey to Massachusetts and about a thousand flights were canceled. Plus Amtrak had to cancel trains between New York and Boston. In Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel is threatening to push for more sanctions against Russia if the Kremlin tries to use that new Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline as a weapon. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has raised the stakes in mounting tension over energy. He imposed conditions on an extension of gas transit agreement with Ukraine, which is an economic lifeline for the former Soviet Republic. Vice President Kamala Harris is in Singapore, where she announced a new supply chain initiative. She and Singapore's Prime Minister also announced agreements on cybersecurity and climate. The two countries want to deepen their economic ties, but the talks today did not cover new trade agreements. And Disney says it has taken $125 million in online revenue from Black Widow. The movie has prompted a lawsuit from its star, Scarlett Johansson. She says she has been cheated out of money be she is due because Disney released the film both in theaters and online. Johansson said her compensation was heavily dependent on theater ticket sales. Disney says she was paid $20 million and is willing to include online sales in calculating her bonuses. I have to say, Francine, I have not yet seen that movie online or in theaters. No, me neither. And, you know, the question is actually, what does this lawsuit mean for other COVID-era movies? Uh, the million-dollar question is, when is James Bond at? We've been waiting for James Bond for, like, two right? years. It feels like a decade. It's time for it, it to come over? out now. Well, we actually watched Casino Royale just to get the spirit to try to get it going <laughs> over the weekend. And then we played poker. Yeah. Yeah, it'll probably be delayed again. You have to watch Casino Royale three more times. Coming up, uh, he's James Bond of the markets, Alberto Gallo. This <laughs> is Bloomberg. That was a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. James Bond of the markets. Hi, Alberto. That's a good way to start the week. <laughs> It is, isn't it? It wasn't, it just came to me like that. It's, it's um, you do have the James Bond look. It's I've Italian been, I've been suits. training in the past few months. For the, for the post COVID reopening. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I liked your note, uh, Alberto, about the last dance. Yeah, we we did a long podcast on China, and we've been a little quiet over the last few weeks because it's August. But there's a lot to say on you know what's happened. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> yep. Great. Lisa, what do you want to talk about? You're heading to Jackson Hole. Uh, yeah, you're right. I'm going to open up Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> we canceled our tickets. I mean, honestly, we could talk oh, about you? that. We could talk about that. Yeah, oh. can we call it Jackson Hole, right? I mean, honestly, this is, you know, Zoomlandia. I didn't realize. And I remember, I, so the, the Bank of England governor got snubbed. <laughs> he didn't get an invite. Really? Well, he didn't get an in-person invite, yeah. Because well, they I, were focusing on U.S. people. I think that um, the, what I want to talk about <coughs> is... Sorry. No, no worries. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. Is the fact... Wait, can you talk to me for a sec? Um, what I want to talk about is just the fact that... Uh, how symbolic is this, in some ways, of the main agenda, which is reversion yeah. back to where we were mm -hmm. months ago? And yeah. we saw that in the PMI data out of Europe this morning. The, you know, this is taking a bite. We saw this last week. How much more are we going to see this? And why would the Fed do anything? I mean, especially they're basically sending the message that they need to send by moving this remote. Yeah. Yeah. Although I'm hearing more and more people actually say that a policy mistake would actually be waiting too long and I feel like that's changed in the last three four months um yeah I mean I, I would agree I think the balance of risks is a lot of people think that it's changed and that's why they keep talking about inflation more than employment in the same kind of way but Well, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacqua here in London, Kelly Lines and Lisa Bramovitz in New York. Well, Matt Miller off today. Now, we're looking at the markets, Lisa. I was excited about your upcoming trip I to did. Jackson Hole, but actually they're cutting it way back, and most of it is virtual now. Yeah, we're not going to Jackson Hole. We're going to Zoomlandia. I mean, that's essentially uh, what we're doing right now. I'm wondering how much this is sending a message, Fran, given the fact that we are seeing increasing concerns about the Delta variant and what that could do to both the labor market as well as just growth in general. I mean, we've got the Labor uh, Secretary of the United States worrying about the potential ramifications on the jobs market in the United States. Mm -hmm. You wonder if basically the, the Fed is saying, don't expect anything. We're going to even be on Zoom. Help. Why are we even going to attend? Yeah, and actually, the, I see more and more market commentary on that, right? It's maybe not the right moment to give us any kind of indication of what happens next. And we're expecting, I think, Joe Biden in September to give us a clues on whether he's keeping Jay Powell in the first place. Kaylee, how's it all playing out in the markets? Well, we're all waiting for virtual Jackson Hole, if you can even call it Jackson Hole. But that is leaving us in positive territory on this Monday morning. Of course, it was a really strong session in Asia, and you are seeing some follow-through uh, risk on sentiment in Europe and the U.S. Right now, the stock 600 is off of its opening highs, but still up about a third of a percent. And S&P 500 futures are also higher by about uh, two, three-tenths of one percent. In the bond market, you also are, are seeing yields ticking up. We're up about two basis points on the 10-year to just shy of 128. And then another assets I have to point to Bitcoin back above $50,000 for the first time since May. And that, of course, is lifting some crypto-related equities in pre-market trading, the likes of BitDigital, Riot Blockchain, each up about 7 or so percent. Two movers to the downside, though, Uber, Lyft, you can throw DoorDash in here as well. A judge in California knocking down a voter-approved ballot measure that would allow these companies to classify their drivers as contractors. The judge saying that actually is unconstitutional, and as a result, those shares are getting weighed down. They're each down about 4 percent before the bell, Francine. Yeah, some of the uh, interesting, really, market movers, Uber, and we saw also read across here in Europe. Now, we're joined by Alberto Gallo, head of macro strategies and portfolio manager for global credit opportunities at Algebris. I like your title, Alberto. Where do you see the biggest opportunities three days before Jackson Hole? Good morning, Francine. So the Jackson Hole Symposium is going to be very quiet in our view. Um, the market is stuck in a narrative 
where uh, there's a lot of worry about uh, imminent tapering. But given the last events that we've seen in China, we could see the Fed delaying the tapering announcement probably towards November. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's an imminent risk. Um, the major issue yeah. here is, however, that China will continue its crackdown on the private sector. And we've seen recently that they have talked about cross-cyclical strategy, which means essentially but we don't care about the cycle. We're going to focus on the long run. And they'll keep hitting yeah, the yeah. private sector. Look, what I liked about in your note is that, of course, you explain very nicely that, you know, some inflation drivers are, of course, uh, transitory, others aren't. But you believe that inflation at the end of the day is a political decision. It is. And, you know, Milton Friedman used to say there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program. So a lot of the spending that we are seeing is because economies have become deeply unequal. If you look at the Google search on books and magazines over the last 100 years, this is the first time that the word inequality is searched more times than earnings or revenues. This never happened you know, over the last century. There is a key development, which is that the median voter is going to become a millennial in the, in the coming 10 years. And that's both uh, you know, in the US and Europe. And millennials have been left out of of the, the boom of the last two decades, which was an asset boom. Uh, it benefited more the baby boomers and people with assets. So now policies are shifting towards you know, being more inclusive, looking at sustainability. Um, both across the US, Europe, and China, they, there's more care about the quality of growth rather than uh, the number, the quantity of growth. Uh, but so if we are seeing a very different approach between the US and China to solve the same problem. We also, of course, are seeing growth slow down in China. There's concerns about the Delta variant and a reversion back uh, to the before times of when we were more deeply in this pandemic. How defensive do you want to be here? So there's three factors driving the market now. The first is monetary policy, which is going to become less expansionary, but it's not a, an, it's not going to be a huge taper tantrum. You know, it's very well telegraphed. The second one is the Delta variant. Uh, it is peaking in the U.S. We're probably at peak Delta fear. Uh, yeah. Every newspaper is titling, you know, Delta and COVID are going to be here forever. But the numbers are showing an improvement. So we're positive on the Delta variant. That's very positive for the U.S. and Europe. Uh, in Asia, governments will probably maintain a zero tolerance policy towards COVID. Finally, there's the Chinese policy against the private sector to reestablish control uh, and improve sustainability. And I think that's going to stay. We're not going to see a lot of easing from China. So we're positive on the U.S. and Europe. We think there's more risk on. On emerging markets in China, we're going to see more weakness. So on balance, obviously, you need to think about which assets offer value. Um, there's not a lot of value today, but there yeah. is some value in equities, in convertibles, and selective in credit. Does cash have value here, Alberto? We want to be very liquid because, you know, China continuing its actions on the private sector can spill over, can create some volatility. We've seen the Asia high yield market, uh, corporate bonds in Asia are two times as wide than other high yield markets. But gradually, this potential credit crunch in Asia can spill over. Uh, and also, obviously, we have less easing. So we want to have liquidity to capture future opportunities. Uh, at the moment, you know, we're invested with around two thirds of our capacity and we have room to add, uh, you know, we want to be the ones buying when there is um, a sell off and when there is a tantrum potentially over the coming months. Alberto, given the fact that you said that we're probably at peak Delta fear, I wonder if the prospects of an inflation overshoot have been raised dramatically because central bankers will hold on to their easy money policies for potentially longer, despite the fact that Delta is passing. So, you know, it, inflation is a very hard variable to predict. And at the core, we have the job market. Um, in the UK, something very interesting is happening, which is that wages are rising. And in the UK, there's been a lack of supply of labor. People have left. Uh, in the US, we don't see that yet. However, uh, you know, we, we do see that there is an improvement in job creation as states take out their, uh, their benefits. Uh, and also, um, in terms of goods inflation, we continue to see the bottlenecks to the supply chain persisting. And that's not going right. to change. You know, China is going to uh, try to play a long-term game against Taiwan. 
and companies will have to onshore production. Think about how many chip Alberto. makers are building factories in the U.S., for example. So that's going to raise costs. Yeah, Alberto, what needs to happen for assets to be repriced right now? The um, equity market, and generally we, we could see more, more repricing if the Fed delays tapering. So we could see a continuation of this bull market. We're not chasing markets here because valuations are already high. But eventually, um, I would say that you know the biggest question that we are going to, uh, to see is, is about inflation. If inflation proves to be more persistent, if these supply bottlenecks continue, which is also our view, later in the year or next year, we could see some um, other central banks uh, withdrawing policy yeah. or needing to withdraw policy and, and are repricing. And also China is at the core okay. of this. China has been tightening as all the other governments were easing. Thank you so much, Alberto Gallo. We'll talk a lot more about China and also some of the regulatory concern. Alberto Gallo, head of macro strategies and portfolio manager for global credit opportunities at Algebris. Now, coming up, Andrew Pekash, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health professor and virologist, will talk booster shots and vaccines. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later on today, Randy Weingarten, American Federation of Teachers President. That's at 1 p.m. in New York, 6 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Lisa Abramowitz in New York and Francine Lacqua in London. Well, the Pfizer COVID vaccine is set to get full FDA approval this week, with the announcement expected to come either today or tomorrow. Shots, of course, have already been given based on emergency use authorization. Dr. Andrew Pekos, Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health professor and virologist, joins us now for more. What difference will full approval make tangibly? Well, the data that is moving forward, the full approval, is data we've been well aware of for some time now. I think there is a perception out there, um, and, and in fact, many people that I've talked to have said the same thing, that full approval will make some individuals a little less hesitant to, to get the vaccine. Um, so I'm hoping that that full approval comes with it, a, a boost in the number of vaccinated people that will be here in the U.S., and again, what we see here in the U.S. will soon follow globally in other countries because, again, it's the same data that's going to get full approval uh, in other countries as well. So I'm hopeful for a boost in the number of vaccinated people because of this full approval. Andy, we were just speaking with Alberto Gallo, a fund manager, who said that we're probably at peak Delta concern. Is that appropriate given the trajectory of the cases and how quickly will we see the caseload diminish? Well, you know, it's... It, it, it's really difficult to predict with, well, the any pandemic, but Delta in particular. You know, we're seeing very different trajectories of Delta in Israel, uh, in the UK, here in the US. The, the cases are being driven by different conditions in those countries. So it's hard to make any sort of big conclusions or general conclusions about what's going on here. Certainly with Delta in the U.S., there's been signs that things are peaking, uh, but they're peaking at levels that are much too high for, for medical infrastructure to handle here in the U.S. So I'm hopeful that over the next couple of weeks we'll continue to see that downward trend, uh, but not to be overly negative, the fall is going to bring us into conditions where virus spread is going to be even more likely. And so it'll be really important to see how things change right around that September time as well. Andy, what comes after Delta? Uh, you know, we're working hard to try to figure that out and see what's happening here. Um, Delta is um, very different from the other variants that have come through. Um, when I look at virus-infected cells here in the laboratory with Delta, I can immediately tell you which cells are infected with Delta and which are infected with other variants because it's such a different virus in the way it behaves in the laboratory and as we see in the population. What we're really concerned about right now is, is Delta is spreading at such high levels, there's so many new mutations that are coming in Delta. 
We don't know yet if any of those are helping Delta or if many of them are just neutral mutations that aren't doing anything. So we're spending a lot of time looking at sequences, isolating viruses from people, and trying to understand if there's anything that's changing about Delta right now, given the large number of cases that are here in the U.S. Andy, what do we misunderstand about vaccines? Or, you know, there are a lot of questions about why we're seeing so many breakthrough uh, cases, actually, with people that have been double vaccinated. Is that what we should think about? And th there's also this idea that we talk about booster shots, but here in the UK or other parts of the world, they say actually m maybe it's easier if you get a mild version of it because then you get an, a, an automatic immune system. Yeah, I think first and foremost, vaccines have to protect against severe disease meaning hospitalization and death after COVID-19 infection. And the vaccines are still working against that to a very high degree. When it comes to protecting from symptomatic disease, again, these vaccines performed really well with variants that were much less aggressive than Delta. They're still performing well against Delta. So even though we talk about breakthrough cases, and, and I've got piles of plates here in my laboratory from individuals who are fully vaccinated that got Delta infections, um, we're studying those responses to see why those people might have been infected. But it's important to note that vaccinated people are still the minority of infections uh, here in the U.S. and, and, and in most countries. Um, so vaccination is working with boosters Personally, I think we really want to keep an eye on the most vulnerable parts of the population, the elderly, mm -hmm. immunocompromised, those with uh, medical conditions that make them more predisposed to severe uh, COVID-19. That's where boosters would certainly be considered. Whether boosters are needed across the country is another question altogether, and yeah. I think there is some uh, difference of opinion in the scientific community about that. A Andy, sh should we also have vaccines for children under 12 years old? Absolutely. I think that um, we we'll see the safety data coming out there. Uh, we can assume that what we've seen in children between the ages of 12 and 17 is going to uh, be similar for those younger children. There's some issues with the dosing and getting the dosing right because younger children probably don't need anywhere close to the dose that an adult gets. So there's some things to work out there. But again, we want to get back to normalcy. Um, Schools are going to be the important thing now that we see Delta can mm -hmm. infect younger individuals and cause disease in those younger individuals. So vaccines for the youngest groups are something that's going to be very, very important, particularly when it comes to schools and educating. Great. Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Andrew Pekos there, Johns Hopkins University, Bloomberg School of Public Health professor and virologist running us through some of the main and most pressing questions about COVID-19. Now coming up, Bitcoin tops $50,000 for the first time since May. We'll get the latest on cryptocurrencies next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now we're joined by Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom, I've never seen this on a Monday. It's like keen on Bitcoin. I'll wake up early for that. Well, Bitcoin we can get to with a market with a nice lift and yields pull back. Abramowitz called me at 1 a.m. and said, look at the real yield. And I said, I'm looking at it. But Bitcoin <laughs> threw to 50,000 or something. I thought of Scott Minard making headlines ages ago with a ginormous uh, number, but the chart's pretty well contained. I mean, I'm sorry, it is an elegant chart. And the simple truth is, is log Bitcoin, slope matters, extrapolates out 100,000 uh, Bitcoin in the spring of 2023 is where you get there. Yeah, I mean, some of the other things I know you've been watching really closely is, is of course, uh, inflation, the 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 210 spread and things like that, Tom. What are you expecting from Jackson Hole this week? Well, I'm, it's a virtual Jackson Hole. We'll have to see what the papers say, but certainly it's all about uh, the chairman's speech. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not surprised it was canceled. I, I, I'll be honest. I was talking about it Friday. Uh, uh, th there's been a real deterioration here in, in the Delta variant, and Francine, even though it's going to be virtual, I think it's still going to be a huge deal. 
Yeah, it will be a huge deal, also because we have a nice Bloomberg scoop out of D.C. that uh, we, it looks like Janet Yellen actually would support Jay Powell to continue in his job, and that's supportive of a lot of asset classes. Yeah, that made a splash this weekend. There's no question about it, but yeah. I, I, I do think that's going to come down to politics, and there's a few other distractions this morning, including Afghanistan. Tom. Thank you so much. We'll sure. have plenty more, of course, uh, with Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Now, for more on Bitcoin, we're joined by Eddie van der Valt from our M Live team. Eddie, when you look at some of the things on Bitcoin, I mean, it's incredible. We're talking about it this morning, right? Fifty thousand dollars, and it's really the rapid ascent of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think you know, and a lot of people didn't think that Bitcoin was going to bounce back this quickly. And you, Bitcoin is a classic Veblen good. Where when prices go up, more people get excited about it. More is written about it. We talk about it on. TV. TV more and more people get pulled in and I think that gets just that self-perpetuation I think we're seeing a little bit of that here I think there's a lot of excitement coming into the into the Bitcoin market and that's you know pulling up the rest of the cryptocurrencies so you know I think there's a space to watch Be because it's more legitimate or does it pay so PayPal right basically said that it could offer crypto services here in the UK does right. that legitimize it or is it just noise at the margin no no I, I, I think I think what it does is it creates an access point right, right. and the more access points you get the more people can get into this market and start buying Bitcoin right as if in the olden days it was really hard to buy Bitcoin you had to send your money overseas you had to you know you, you had to trust uh, somebody who you know a company that you had no knowledge of now if PayPal gets into this game if uh, we see a US ETF that makes it possible for more investors to get in and that you know brings just more money into the space do you think we're close I mean we, we spoke to you know Jesse Powell of Kraken we spoke spoke to CZ of Binance and we always ask about this ETF is it coming and actually what does that mean also for some of, of them actually yeah. what they you know their platforms such a good question because I think this is actually this is one where you you really need to look at what's happening if we do see a US ETF I think what we'll see is a is a cash settled futures contract right of a, 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 a ET an ETC one mm -hmm. that's backed by 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 cash settled futures and that doesn't create new demand for Bitcoin. In the short term, it'll create excitement and we'll see more people come in. In the long term, that actually takes demand away from actual, I want to say physical, but actual Bitcoin. So I think in the long term, it's more bearish than people think. Do I talk about technicals or do we not talk about technicals? Ah, I mean, there's nothing Maybe. else to look at. Maybe, you know, I think, I think if, the, if you're going to look at technicals anywhere, you've got to look at it in the Bitcoin space, right? I think Bitcoin is driven by animal spirits more than anything else. So I think it matters. I think it matters that Bitcoin didn't collapse this time around. It shows us that there's fundamental support. But I think it, you know, ultimately, I think that chart, that uh, logarithmic chart that Tom just showed us. The I elegant chart. The elegant chart. It is an elegant chart. And I think, but I think what that chart also showed me is that the volatility of Bitcoin is dying down. And I think that matters a little bit. Um, so, yes, I think the technicals matter. And I think the technicals are supportive at this point. So, Eddie, you were way up front and looking at some of the commodity stocks. And actually, you know, commodities in general, also the read across the currencies. Mm. Like, what's happening? Is Jackson Hole going to move maybe, you know, currencies more or less in commodities? I, I, I think I think commodities is really where it's going to be played out for the for the next few months. I think commodities are really at risk from Jackson Hole and from higher you know from from higher rates and from a pushback on inflation. But I think there's another dynamic here, and we saw that today in the PMIs coming in. I think we're seeing that demand is shifting away from the goods industry mm -hmm. to the services industry. I think people are going out, they're going to restaurants, they not, haven't got that much money to spend on physical goods anymore, and I think that takes the pressure off inflation as it comes via commodities but it puts pressure on inflation as it comes via wages so you know I think there's there's so much to talk about this week I, I, I can't be more excited and maybe more China regulation absolutely Eddie thank you so much Eddie van der Velt there from our Emmet live team now more, more Bloomberg surveillance is coming up we'll hear from Bill Dudley Bloomberg opinion columnist and former New York Fed president amongst others the markets as Eddie was just saying for the moment there's a bid for the markets uh, there is also a little bit of a summer lull so we have a couple of our great blogs actually working overtime to make sure that we understand all of the minutia in the markets Bloomberg surveillance up shortly this is Bloomberg <laughs>